The Oakland A's try to sell state lawmakers on a publicly funded stadium plan, plus how Southern Nevada's largest food bank is addressing an increase in food insecurity. That's this week on Nevada Week. Support for Nevada Week is provided by Senator William H. Hernstadt. Welcome to Nevada Week. I'm Amber Renee Dixon. We begin in Carson City, where Nevada's 82nd legislative session will soon come to a close on June 5th. So will the athletics get their stadium funding bill passed in time? For that, we bring in Nevada Independent reporter Sean Galanka. And Sean, we will get to the A's, but first, there were some negotiations overnight between Wednesday and Thursday. What happened and how much sleep have you gotten? <laughs> Uh, very little sleep, Amber. Uh, the Capitol press corps was was at the Capitol um, around midnight to watch Governor Joe Lombardo sign a pair of the uh, five major budget bills that are, are basically used to fund our state government over the next two years. And um, that came after hours of negotiations on, on Wednesday between Democratic leadership and the legislature and the governor. Uh, basically, lawmakers move forward a couple of, of high profile school safety bills in order to get the governor's signature on those those couple budget bills. OK, so what did the budget bills entail? So one of those budget bills is the K-12 education funding bill. It's the, it's the largest uh, education funding bill in state history, uh, basically boosting K-12 education funding to a, a record high in state history. And the other one is uh, colloquially, no colloquially known as the Authorizations Act, it basically authorizes federal spending uh, for things like Medicaid. OK, and as you had mentioned, the governor had threatened to veto these state budget bills if he hadn't gotten his priorities addressed. So in exchange, he got a couple of school safety bills passed. What do those include? So those uh, basically reverse some of the restorative justice policies that uh, the legislature had passed in 2019. Uh, Lombardo campaigned on this in, in 2022, basically um, you know, talking about a rise in violence in our schools, uh, especially in Clark County. Uh, we've seen attacks on teachers. And so this is going to put some extra teeth into state laws, uh, allowing for school discipline, basically, and trying to, to amp up that school safety um, and keep teachers safe and, and students as well. Yeah, so overhauling the restorative justice measures, which uh, provided alternatives to expulsion and suspension with an end goal of decreasing the number of students that end up in the criminal court system. Uh, as you mentioned, three more budget bills have to go before the governor. He either signs or vetoes them or they become law. Uh, I encourage our viewers to follow your reporting for updates on that. But let's go to the A's bill now. The A's owner, John Fisher, uh, doesn't make a lot of appearances, but he was actually at the state legislature on Wednesday, along with the team president, uh, lobbying for up to $380 million in public funding for a $1.5 billion stadium on the Las Vegas Strip. What kind of impact did their presence make, if any? You know, I think it was a, a subtle impact publicly. Certainly, they were they were moving around the building, going to different lawmakers and, and probably whipping votes on the bill, um, you know, just trying to talk to folks about what they're seeking in Las Vegas. And so um, they weren't present for the bill's initial hearing earlier this week, but they did come into the building to, to talk directly to lawmakers and, and, you know, kind of sell them on this idea. And broadly, Sean, what do you think the A's chances are of getting this bill through in time? <laughs> That's a difficult question, Amber. Um, you know, I'll say the governor is supportive of this, but on, on the flip side of that, we see some key Democratic lawmakers, including Assemblywoman Danielle Monroe Moreno, who chairs uh, the powerful Assembly Ways and Means Committee, which this bill will have to pass through. Um, and she said she is a, a hell no on the bill earlier this week. And so um, the A's are, are going to be working to get get her on their side. What would be her reasoning for hell no? I think that the public funding aspect of this, right? So the bill caps public funding for the stadium at $380 million. And so uh, that's a lot of money to invest in a stadium that might otherwise be able to go to government services. You know, that's that's state funds that could be spent on, on health care or housing, county funds that could go to, to similar services. And so it's really a question of where do you want that money to go? 
Um, and, and that's kind of being settled in the legislature right now. Yeah, and that $380 million would be a combination of transferable tax credits and public bonds. Let's move now to another big appearance at the legislature, and that was new Las Vegas resident and actor Mark Wahlberg. He was there in support of the film tax credit program, a, a massive expansion of it. Did he have anything interesting to say? Anything substantial? Yeah, right. The second big Hollywood actor to come to the legislature in the past couple of weeks. Jeremy Renner was here recently, too. And um, Mark Wahlberg basically came up to, to show his support for the bill, um, kind of talk about the, the vision for Hollywood 2.0 in Las Vegas. And so um, I think he really just emphasized that, that he thinks this is a program that will help build out the film industry in Vegas. And and uh, he sees a, a, a strong talent pool for the industry in Vegas, and, and he's supportive of that. So where does this bill stand now? I mean, Monday, June 5th is the end of the session. Right. This is, um, it, it's, it's really up in the air. Yesterday, my colleagues and I spoke with uh, Lombardo's chief of staff, Ben Kiekeffer, and he talked about how the, the general fund liabilities of this bill are unlike anything we've ever seen. You know, $190 million in annual tax credits is, is really a significant chunk of money to basically take out of the state budget that, you know, like I said, with the A's bill could otherwise be going to, to other government services like education. And so um, even though Democratic lawmakers, I think, are, are pushing this bill forward, there's still a lot of discussion about amendments. And uh, we, we just don't know where the governor really stands on it. Hmm. And this could possibly bring Sony Films to Southern Nevada. Uh, as you've reported, this has been in the works for a couple of years. Why was it introduced so late in the session then? I think it was just kind of, you know, bringing, bringing everyone on board, working out all the pieces. This is not uncommon in the Nevada legislature where we see really big policies introduced so late in the session. I take the, the Oakland Athletic Stadium deal bill, for example, that was introduced, you know, in the couple final weeks of the session. And so, uh, it just tends to be how our lawmakers work with these things, it seems. Why is that common here, do you think? I think, you know, for one, they're working on the budget for a lot of the session. And so they're kind of getting an idea of what money do we even have to spend on something like tax credits for the film industry or tax credits for the A's. And um, I think also this this legislature has some issues with transparency. They're not subject to the open meeting law like many other public bodies in Nevada. And so Sometimes it's just difficult to know what's going on behind the scenes here at the legislature. And to your point, I think people felt the same way when they heard that there was going to be the hearing about the A's bill on Monday, which was Memorial Day. Uh, Sean Galanka with the Nevada Independent, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Amber. Back here in southern Nevada, the food bank Three Square says one in seven of our neighbors is hungry. Add in a recent reduction in SNAP benefits, formerly known as food stamps, and the food bank says even more people don't know where their next meal will come from. Nevada Week visited Three Square to discuss that and more with Director of Operations Maurice Johnson, Senior Outreach Manager Nolga Valadez, and Event Marketing Manager Will Edwards. Well, thank you all for joining Nevada Week. Before we talk about food insecurity, I want to mention the volunteers that are in the background. They are packing meals for Meet Up and Eat Up, a program we're going to be talking about. And you told me off camera, Maurice, that they are from Coach Cares, yes. the handbag company. How yes. neat. Uh, volunteerism reportedly took a hit during the pandemic. It was down. I wonder if that happened here and how are you doing now in that area? So if I can, I can give a little bit of context. Sure. Um, Pre-pandemic, we would have roughly about 34,000 volunteers coming through our facility, helping us out with various different programs that we had offered at the time. How but, often was that? Uh, this was throughout the course of a year. Okay. Um, you fast forward to pandemic hits, everything shuts down. Well, we had to shut down in that aspect um, because of uh, safety concerns, COVID. Early on, no one even knew what it was except for it was very bad. Uh, and ultimately, some of those programs that we offered during that, that time frame with some of our community partners have not been able to come back. So when you look at 34,000 volunteers annually, now down to about 13,000, that's a huge drop off. Wow. Um, but with the programs that we do have in place and still have here, uh, we're just so gracious and so thankful for those volunteers that still come in 
each and every single day, whether it's a group like Coach Cares uh, or individuals. We have some individuals that come here every single day, almost like a full-time job. Just on their own. You don't have to be part of a group. Right. Well, speaking of COVID, Nolga, when it started, people receiving SNAP benefits began receiving a second monthly payment as well. As of April, though, that second monthly payment is no longer there. What kind of impact has that had on the groups that you serve? Um, yes, that is correct. Um, we saw the last uh, monthly extra allotment come in in the month of March. Um, after that, it went back to what it was pre-pandemic. Uh, one thing we do want to make clear is that SNAP has not gone away. We want to make sure that everybody understand that SNAP continues. It was just the emergency allotment that went away. And uh, while some of those reductions were uh, extreme. Give me an example for seniors. <laughs> right, so a senior typically uh, receive around $23 a month of uh, benefits. Uh, with the um, emergency allotment, they were getting an extra about 200 and something dollars per month extra. Wow. So with that going away now, they see about a 91% reduction in their benefits. Mm -hmm. So, which is a very extreme impact for, for them. I struggle to understand how $23 was significant enough in the first place for seniors. Who were these seniors on Social Security, I would think? Yes, that is correct. Usually they're on a fixed income uh, receiving Social Security benefits, and uh, they're the ones receiving typically those $23. Okay. Uh, what kind of impact has it had now that they're no longer getting that? Uh, second monthly payment. Are you feeling it here at the food bank? Yes, we are receiving more phone calls in our call center. Uh, people seeking where they can get that uh, missing component. Um, so we're seeing people asking for where can I go get food? Uh, food. So we're giving out you know food pantry locations as well as our golden groceries program that allows the seniors to go to specific golden groceries um, pantries where they can get that extra help as well as the lift rights that is f free of charge to them if they don't have transportation. So we're able to accommodate them with that. Maurice, fair to say increased need as a result of those SNAP benefits no longer being there, the second monthly payment? Indeed. So increased need, you have inflation as well. Mm -hmm. Where do donations stand? And can you paint a picture of, do you have enough food? Uh, well, I can tell you, um, donations are, are, are down, and, and I'm ta talking specifically to food donations. Uh, inflation not only impacted each and every single one of our individual households, it also impacted a lot of our retail uh, donors as well. Um, so they're having to watch their bottom line. That's where a lot of those donations were coming from. Um, we're hoping that they can come back soon. Uh, but in the interim, of course, uh, when individuals can give to us financially, we can still stretch every single dollar to make three complete full meals. You know, so if people still want to contribute in that way, that is a massive blessing for us, being a part of the Feeding America Network. It's better for you to get a monetary donation yes. as opposed to a food donation mm -hmm. because you can, as you mentioned, make that dollar stretch. Yes. Okay, I want to bring in you, Will, about inflation and how it's impacted Restaurant Week, which will you tell me about that? It's one of your biggest fundraisers of the year. Yes, it's one of our biggest fundraisers. I always look at Restaurant Week as a great community activity. You know, and it gives, it really shows us the humanity in our community because people come together, they have a meal, and then a meal is then given to someone in our community who needs it the most. So that's how it works. You go to a restaurant uh, and part of what you're paying for goes to Three Square. That is correct. How has inflation impacted you this know, year's event? It's very, it's very interesting. Um, you know, some people, uh, some restaurants couldn't do it uh, because of it. But on the flip side of that, we have this year the most participants ever in the history of Restaurant Week. We have more than 230 participants for Restaurant Week this year. So even though inflation is hitting the restaurants as well, they're still coming back. It's Vegas strong, you know. Mm. And inflation is hitting everyone mm -hmm. uh, when they go out to eat. So how expensive is this to take part in? Well, every restaurant that participates, they agree to do a three course prefix menu at a fixed price. So when I go through uh, restaurantweeklv.org, you can filter through uh, price points to find everything. I believe that there is something for everyone 
on restaurant week. For example, there are tons of $20 lunches out there. And, and the other day, I went to a little uh, fast food place to grab a couple of sandwiches for myself and my wife, and it cost me $25. You can go out and get a three-course lunch for 20 bucks and help your hungry neighbor at the same time. It's a win-win. Noga, I want to bring you back in and go to more of a national perspective that could filter down to Southern Nevadans. Um, as of this taping, the debt ceiling deal that is reportedly in the works has additional work requirements for older Americans, um, excluding veterans and homeless people, but that they would have to work in order to receive assistance. So currently, according to the New York Times, work requirements apply to able-bodied adults 49 years old and younger. This deal would raise the age to 54 years old. What do you think about that? What kind of impact do you think it would have if that's what ends up happening? Yeah, well, the reality of it is that the older we get, the harder it is to find work. So, um, you know, <laughs> increasing the age group may make it a little bit a little bit more challenging to to be able to obey to that new um, to this new requirement yes it sounds uh, kind of scary then for a food bank like yourself what are you preparing for what do you foresee coming down the pipeline so when we're bringing food into the food bank I mean our biggest priority is trying to make sure we get the bang for the buck um, so we've gotten very creative with trying to make sure that we're not leaving any stones unturned to try and get the best price to get the food in here for our hungry neighbors. Okay, and how have you gotten creative in that process? More vendors. Uh, so we've used more vendors than we ever have in, in the past. Um, we had like a select few that we could bounce numbers off of. Now we're using anywhere from 25 to 30 different vendors for different commodities. You know, so whether it's fresh produce, whether it's dairy, uh, proteins, frozen proteins, you name it. Uh, we're trying to shake those trees and see what we can get. Okay, so you're looking around to find the best price possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, getting creative. I think Restaurant Week also fits in with that, Will. What are you particularly excited about this year with Restaurant Week? First of all, it's our 16th year doing Restaurant Week. And I'm excited because there's so much variety this year on Restaurant Week. We, I mean, of course, you have Mexican, we have Mediterranean, we have Filipino food, Chinese. It's so many uh, uh, opportunities to go out and find your favorite new place. So whatever you're feeling like, you can probably find. Uh, and that is how people can help 3Square. But let's talk about other ways in which 3Square is helping people uh, meet up and eat up. What is that program? So Meet Up and Eat Up is our summer food service program in which we go out into the community. There's roughly 80 sites that we go out to um, actually support kids that eat that need to eat during the summer months. Uh, unfortunately, on the free and reduced lunch program and when school's over, those kids may not have anything to eat. That's where we're, we work to try and close that gap so they can have a new, nutritious meal so they can be a kid during the summer months. And when we spoke on the phone prior to this interview, Nolga, you had a message you wanted to make sure that you got across um, about some of the misconceptions about the people that utilize food banks. What was that message? Yes, you know, we, we have this uh, misconception that perhaps people that are receiving SNAP benefits or are utilizing these benefits are people that do not want to work or they're lazy and they just want to sit at home. When the reality of it is that uh, it's, it's not necessarily true. The majority of the people receiving SNAP benefits actually do work. It's just that they're not making enough to, to be able to meet the needs that they have especially with families when you have single parenting, or maybe there is two parents but only one working, or maybe they both work but they don't make enough. I see all of you nodding your heads. Mm -hmm. You experience this personally here? Yes. Yeah. Without a doubt. I mean, I, it, you know, like Noga said, anybody who needs help, we won't turn, we won't turn anybody away, but it's working families. You know, it's families, it's individuals that are trying to make ends meet and they just can't do it, so they, they just need a little boost, just a tiny bit of, of help and assistance to get them over that hump. And we've had people come in and say, I was, I was doing terribly, you guys helped me, here's a donation, I'm doing much better now, I don't need the service. Very neat, thank you all for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Another nonprofit helping fight food insecurity is the Obodo Collective. Nevada Week's Maria Silva got a special tour of their new urban farm on Las Vegas's historic west side. A little 
Little Birdie told me that I grow the best arugula. Oh. <laughs> Chef and master gardener Cheyenne Kyle is definitely growing some of the best and tastiest arugula in town. This is going to taste uh. very different from what you get in grocery stores. Joining Cheyenne on this very special taste testing, the Abodo Collective co-founder Erica Vitalizar and executive director Tamika Henry. But it's so fresh and it's so refreshing and then oh my God. The Aboto Collective's vibrant and bountiful urban farm, plus all of the other services they offer, already making a difference in the historic west side. This location was chosen because this area, it lacked a lot of things. Um, access to fresh produce, grocery stores. We really focus on multi-generations to get them out of poverty. And so there are programs that we have. Our three main pillars is food security, so we have the farm here. We also focus on housing. Once they're stable, like they have housing stable, they're food secure, then we work on getting them employed. We take a holistic approach. We want the whole family to be well, and so we also connect um, families who need child care resources. We connect them to the resources. Rooted in a community with such rich history, Tamika, Cheyenne, and Erica also wanted to honor the beautiful, strong women and mothers turned activists who came before them. And they did so with this breathtaking mural. Miss Ruby Duncan, she's someone who I consider an inspiration, a mentor. I've had some beautiful conversations with Miss Ruby. This is Miss Ruby Duncan's work. This is the work of Boboto to really combat systemic poverty, systemic racism, systemic, you know, all of these oppressive forces that many of us experience has to be, I think, combated with this kind of beauty, this kind of discipline that Cheyenne and Tamika have as they tend every day to the families that come to Abodo for some sort of assistance. The beautiful mural also honors indigenous women and mothers. We consulted with dear sister Fawn Douglas from the Wapa Paiute. In conversation with Fawn, we really understood that it was not one tribe that we're honoring, not one indigenous visage that we're honoring, but a collective. So this is our sister looking in to the work, looking into the future, honoring the past, honoring what's to come. This masterpiece, a collaborative effort involving talented local artists. Deron Boy, Malachi Williams. The actual color of her face is called something ruby. Every color that's in her is in her, just kind of the opposite. And then we had Courtney Haywood come in. He's an activist, someone who's very much into community building as well as an artist. He saw Malachi and Daron at work and said, can I, can I lend a hand? So you have this kind of the hand of three beautiful artists, three beautiful legacy makers in their own right. We had the honor of experiencing firsthand how neighbors have embraced and welcomed the Aboto Collective and its urban farm. She's very soft-spoken and forceful. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> that thank you is everything that you know, we really dreamed of and envisioned because we've all been in these spaces. I was not born of the West Side, but I'm from a West Side. On your beautiful website, you have a Spanish proverb. It's one of my favorites. More grows in the garden than what the gardener sows. I think it kind of encapsulates everything that I'm really um, aiming for here. It's about growing friendships, growing communities, growing connections, growing in love, growing in gratitude. So I have some, um, some collards, I have bunches of dill, I have some kale. We got a lovely ladybug oh, here. We're very, very lucky. We have more continental growing days than any other state, you know. Really? We, have, we can grow so much. I grow year round. You just have to grow with the season. I actually had a, um, a neighbor from down the street who was a veteran come and just eat a radish out of the bed. And he was like, it was so good. They're so crispy and juicy and flavorful. So. And to have, again, little yeah. kids to our veterans coming in here. That's yeah. special. Oh my goodness, it means the world to me. 
I feel really, really fortunate and very grateful to be able to do this and to share it with everyone. I love that you're elated. You haven't stopped smiling since you got here. It makes my heart so happy because I know what this means to this beautiful community. Yeah. And to our city and to know that you're doing this again with such love and I love what your shirt says, get help, give help. Yes. And that's what it's all about. Yes, definitely. What do you love the most to be able to harvest and share with the world? We have cherry snacking tomatoes, which are the better variety to grow here if you're growing in Nevada. It's not gonna taste like any tomato you've ever had, I promise. Right off the vine, fresh from the farm. It's so juicy too, and again, I can't eat by myself, so buen provecho. Bon appetit. Bon appetit. Mm. Mm. Oh, it's so good. Well, we love the stories that our Maria Silva brings us as well. Thank you to her. The farm is open to the public, and every Sunday morning, you can pick your own fresh produce for a small fee. The farm is also planning other community events, like just a few weeks ago, to celebrate the unveiling of that beautiful mural Maria showed us in the story. The farm held a special screening of the documentary Storming Caesar's Palace, a film inspired by the life of activist Ruby Duncan. You can watch that documentary by visiting our website, vegaspbs.org. And that is also where you can see any of the other resources that we have discussed here on Nevada Week. For now, thank you for watching, and we will see you next week on Nevada Week. <laughs>